Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Uh, the title of this morning's message is a question. Is the gospel enough? Is the gospel enough? Is the gospel enough uh, for someone to become a believer? The gospel message that is sharing, it, it, it's a verbal message. It's a, it, it's a truth statement that people have to either accept or reject, Right? Is that enough? We discover in this morning's uh, text, verses 1 through 6 of Mark chapter 6, that the gospel is enough. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Apostle Paul says that Jews ask for signs. And this passage here in Mark 6, 1 through 6, the audience here are, is particularly a group of Jewish people. From Jesus' hometown, Nazareth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.22 that Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. So think of those people in the world today who are trying to find truth through pursuits, intellectual pursuits, through science, through philosophy, through religion. Greeks search for wisdom, Jews ask for signs. Paul says, but we Christians who are not Jew or Greek, we're from everyone across the world. There are some Jewish Christians, some Greek Christians, but we preach, we proclaim Christ crucified. And how is that going to go over to Jews and Greeks? Well, to Greeks, Christ crucified, God becoming a man Dying for the sins of the world, foolishness, silly, nonsense. To the Jew who's asking for signs from God, the message of the cross, the message of the gospel is a scandal. It's a stumbling block. But we preach Christ crucified because the gospel is enough. The gospel is enough to save. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 39, to those who are demanding a sign, another sign, by the way, he's given tons of signs throughout his ministry and they're demanding a sign. What sign will you give to us to prove that you are who you say you are? Yada, yada, yada. He says, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of who? Jonah. The sign of Jonah. Jonah. Meaning that the message about Jesus, that the, that the gospel is complete, that message is complete after Jesus' resurrection. So now that he's raised, you have all the information that you need to believe in Jesus. Even these people from his hometown in Nazareth. Everyone, after Jesus is raised from the dead, everyone has the responsibility, the opportunity to believe the gospel. The gospel is enough. In Romans 1.17, Paul says the gospel is enough because he says in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does he mean by that? He means that even though we are bound by our sin, even though that our sin has increased, you know, it's crazy, the advances that we make in technology and in science and in, in learning, have they made us a less sinful humanity no we invent new ways to sin don't we like with all the things that God has given us all the discoveries we've been able to make think of medicine the power that we have been given by God to heal people with medicine with surgeries what are we using medicine for now to maim to maim human beings to turn human beings into things that God did not intend for us to be. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Save us from ourselves. The gospel is the only way that we can be saved. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. That is our one and only hope to be made right with God and to be saved is in the gospel. 
It's explicit. It's not one of many messages that can get you to heaven. Jesus says, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me or by me. You say, well, okay, sermon's over. We answer the question, is the gospel enough? Well, what does this text have to do with it? Follow along with me in your copy of the scriptures, starting in verse one. Talking about Jesus. And he went out from there, and he came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. There are two main things that we're going to discover from this passage this morning that keep us from drifting into error. Because it's moments like these in Scripture that people for centuries and centuries have misunderstood the uh, person and work of Jesus Christ. Now notice some things from this passage. In verse 2, these people were astonished. The listeners in this scenario were astonished, but they were astonished for different reasons than most of Jesus' audiences were astonished. They were astonished because they knew Jesus. They knew Him personally. He was from their hometown. He was from their town. They knew Him. And so, they wondered, how could Jesus have acquired this knowledge and ability? When he, left, when he left here, he was just a carpenter, the son of Mary. Look, we see his sisters over here. We know this guy. They wondered out loud. They didn't just think these things to themselves. They wondered these things out loud to the watching world so that everyone else there, including his disciples, including Jesus' disciples, could perceive their reaction. Imagine what they must have thought. The disciples thinking, well, here Jesus is in his hometown. These people know him. And they don't know about him what we know about him? We just saw him deliver a man from a legion of demons. We just saw him calm the storm and the waves and the wind. How do they not know this about Jesus? Jesus. If anyone was qualified to give support to the idea that Jesus' ministry was divinely inspired, it would have been this particular crowd. If people wanted to verify Jesus truly is the Son of God or that He, that he is special in some way, where would they go? I can imagine the investigative reporters from NBC and ABC saying, well, let's go to this hometown, let's talk to the people that know Him best, interview His family. They didn't see Jesus coming into town and exclaim, yes, the miracle worker has returned. He didn't have that kind of welcome. Jesus didn't have celebrity status there. It always makes me laugh when small towns around where I'm from have these things that they claim, their claims to fame, right? Nobody know, nobody's ever heard of this town, but they always talk about that one quarterback who graduated from their high school who went on to bigger things. We're the hometown of so-and-so. And And then when that so-and-so comes back to do a hometown tour, boy, everybody comes out in droves, don't they? I passed uh, a museum the other day in Tempe on on our way to the Botanical Gardens. It's the first time I I discovered this. Do you know where the 
A lot well you do now. Do you know where the largest fire museum in the world is? Tempe, Arizona. Yeah. I, I was watching a show not long ago. They were talking about these people from a small podunk town in Wisconsin. They said, yeah, it's the home of the fifth largest thermometer in the world. Okay, not sure when I'm going to need that information, but... You would think that these people would have come out in droves. It's Jesus, the Son of Mary. He's coming back. We know all about him, but they didn't. They didn't know. This scenario also showed Jesus' disciples that what was happening through Jesus' ministry was unique and that he was divine. By accompanying Jesus back to his old stomping grounds, the disciples could see that Jesus had not acquired his heavenly wisdom, his miraculous abilities, all the things they see Jesus doing. He didn't acquire those things from his childhood education. They might think, well, wow, if we go back to his hometown, we want to find out who he studied under, who was his mentor, who were the people he rubbed shoulders with. He didn't get that. He didn't come to those conclusions. It wasn't his educational background. It wasn't the things he was exposed to as a child. Even Nathaniel. When Nathaniel, one of the disciples, is invited to follow Jesus, he finds out he's from Nazareth. You remember what Nathaniel says? He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's the reputation that this town had. Can anything good come out of there? Well, Jesus did. There's got to be a reason. Got to be a reason. The people in Jesus' hometown simply refer to him as a carpenter and the son of Mary. One of Mary's kids. Now this scenario has led some, as mentioned earlier, throughout history to take up the errant doctrine of adoptionism. Adoptionism. It's different from adoption. The Bible teaches very clearly the doctrine of adoption. That is that when people come to faith in Christ, we are adopted. We're not rightful heirs to God. People say, well, people are born in the image of God. Yes, that's true. Everybody's a child of God. That's not true. We become children of God through Jesus Christ. We, we obtain adoption as heirs through Jesus only. There's a difference between adoption, the doctrine of adoption, and adoptionism. Adoptionism is an ancient heresy based upon passages like this read out of context, that's why we have to be careful when we study the Bible, right? Don't pull things out of context. Try to read it in context. But it's the idea that Jesus was not divine until his baptism. That Jesus wasn't divine when he was in Mary's womb. He wasn't divine when he was lying in the manger. He took on divinity at his baptism. He was adopted. His sonship was something that was created within time. Only then, at his baptism, did the Father bestow divinity upon the Son, according to the adoptionists. Also, according to adoptionism, Jesus became the Son of God, became the Son of God at his baptism. So they claim, in this passage in Mark, that this scenario supports their view because if Jesus were divine during his upbringing in Nazareth, the people described here in Mark 6 would not have been surprised by his works, by his divine abilities. Why are they surprised? It must be because he didn't become divine until later, they would say. But there are a couple of facts for us to consider in this passage particularly about this situation in Nazareth that contradict an adoptionist approach to Jesus' identity. And these are the ones I want you to know about this morning. Number one is Mary's obedience. Mary's obedience. It's, it's not explicit here, but if you read between the lines, it's there. Think about it. If you're a mother, and, and you know about your child's greatness... Let's just say you don't know for sure, but you're a mother, right? And you want to believe it. And you think your child is the best. What do you do? And small town where, I, where I, small town where I'm from, you put it in the paper. You call the local paper. You say, hey, did you see what my son or daughter did? 
Do you know who they are? I am proud. I want to tell everybody. Well, Mary was silent. Maybe it's because the adoption today. Maybe it's because Jesus wasn't divine until later. Maybe Mary is just as surprised as the crowd. Well, maybe, but we have information to the contrary if we go back to Luke chapter 2 verse 19. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the Bible says that Mary was said to have, quote, treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. How long did she ponder them? What were the these things that she specifically knew about Jesus that maybe other people didn't at his birth, but that she knew, and the shepherds knew, and Joseph knew, and the animals (laughs) knew? What are those things? How long did she ponder those things in her heart? Luke may be stating here that Mary, in submission to God's will, waited for God's mysterious plan in his son to unfold in God's timing. That is remarkable submission if you're a parent, if you're a mother, who's been through what Mary has been through. You know, we're really, we're really careful as Protestants, as, as non-Catholics, to guard the way in which we think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's right for us to do that. But don't miss... Don't miss that even before Jesus calls his first disciples, there was perhaps the most solid disciple already present in Jesus' life, his own mother, who followed the obedience of the Lord and was quiet when it was so hard to be quiet. When the fullness of the time came, when the time was Fulfilled, Jesus talks about there in Mark chapter 1. Mark says, when the fullness of the time had came, when the time was fulfilled, Jesus said, now the time has been fulfilled. It's time for me to start my ministry. Now's the time. Mary had waited and waited and waited and waited for that time. It wasn't that she didn't possess the knowledge of Jesus' divinity. It's that she was obedient to God. Therefore, she did not feel at liberty to disclose the identity of Jesus to her neighbors as much as she probably wanted to. The liberty she did not have is one that we as Christ's followers not only possess today, but one that has matured from simple liberty to duty. See, we're not like Mary. Not on this side of the cross. Not on this side of the resurrection. We don't have that ministry that Mary had. Jesus commands his followers in Matthew 28, 19 through 20 to go and make disciples because the fullness of the time had come. Now all authority had been given to him everywhere. And he commissions us to go and to tell. Paul says to the Corinthian Christians, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And also in that same letter, Paul says, For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. Different scenario than Mary So the reason for Mary's silence about Jesus among her neighbors was obedience. That was the reason. She was obeying the Lord. The reason for our silence can only be disobedience. This side of the cross. When Jesus returned to his hometown, the people there were surprised because Mary was obedient to wait. The timing of the Lord. When Jesus comes again to this earth, Will our friends and neighbors be surprised when they see him? Or will they say, yes, we have heard the wondrous story of Jesus Christ, but we didn't believe it was true. That's a different scenario, isn't it? 
So the first thing is Mary's obedience. The second thing is distinguishing Jesus' divine nature from divine fulfillment. There's a difference between Jesus' divine nature and his divine fulfillment. There's an unfolding that takes place throughout Jesus' ministry. The Bible refers to this many times as the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. Jesus' baptism, his resurrection, the Father's decrees and pronouncements, as we saw in Mark 1.11, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. That is a pronouncement. That is a declaration. It is not an ontological statement. It's not saying, now, because he's baptized, now he's the Son no, it's a pronouncement. It's a recognition. It's an unfolding for people to see. The Bible says in Romans 1.4 that after his resurrection, Jesus was declared the Son of God with power. How? Do you know? By the resurrection of the dead. By his resurrection, he is now proclaimed, declared the Son of God with power. The adoptionist will say, see, there you go. He becomes the Son of God after his resurrection. It's not what the scripture says, is it? It says he's declared. He's pronounced. It becomes obvious to everyone, especially those in Nazareth who, who knew him when he was a child. And here going, wait a minute, this, this is not right. We know his sisters, we know his family, we saw him grow up. Well, after his resurrection, he appears to 500 plus witnesses and everybody knows People from all around the region are in Jerusalem during the Feast of the Passover. It's not coincidence that God timed it that way. Word would reach Nazareth. He is the Son of God. He's risen from the dead. Not He has now become the Son of God with power. In John 3.16, Jesus is said to have been begotten by the Father. You probably all know that verse by heart, right? The only, God gave his only what? Begotten Son. Begotten Son. And the earliest creeds in Christianity are explicit to explain the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus that way. That he was begotten, not made. Council of Nicaea was explicit in describing this is how the Bible speaks about Jesus. We have to be careful that we say he was begotten but not made, uncreated. The Bible uses anthropomorphic language. That is, God gives us ways to understand the things that he does by giving us words to describe how it works. How was Jesus begotten? Well, differently than we are. He was born of the Holy Spirit to a virgin. Wait a minute, that, that doesn't happen in the real world. Exactly. How do you explain? He's, he's begotten. There's a relationship between Father and Son. Between God the Father and God the Son. How do we explain that Jesus is fully divine if he is in some ways subject to the Father's will. When he prays, thy will be done, there's, there's a relationship there that we, we can't really understand, but the Bible describes very explicitly. That we must be careful not to confuse. So there are several passages in the New Testament that give us difficulty in explaining who Jesus is without becoming an adoptionist or falling into error. But remember, reading the scripture in context, in Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3, the writer of Hebrews says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. This brings Jesus, the Son, all the way back to the very beginning. 
Paul even says in Romans 11, 32 through 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews says. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Perhaps the, the one gospel writer who explains Jesus' divinity most clearly and most dynamically is John, who says in the first chapter of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. All things came into being by Him and apart from Him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was a life and the life was the light of men. See, when we, when we read those begetting passages in context with the rest of God's Word, we see that Something else is going on here in Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, don't we? It's Mary's obedience. That's why these townspeople don't, don't know about Jesus. It's because of the obedience of Mary. Waiting patiently for the will of God to unfold. The people don't know about Jesus, not because He wasn't divine, but because of God's timing of unfolding everything. In John 8, 56 through 58, Jesus says something, whew, gets him in a lot of trouble. Have you ever done that? Whew. Except we do it on accident. He did it on purpose. He says, your father Abraham, talking to a Jewish audience, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And that got him into a heap of trouble. Because he's saying something about his divinity. That he is one with the Father from the very beginning. As of today, there is nothing more to add to the divinity of Jesus. He was in the beginning creating the world. All of the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him as he lay in the manger in Bethlehem and the moments before he was ever baptized by John in the Jordan. God had raised him from the dead He had been declared the Son of God with power. All authority has been given to Him. And He commissioned His church to go and make disciples. The unfolding has already happened within time and space. His divine nature was always sure, but the unfolding of His mission has always come in stages. And at this stage in his ministry, God does not allow the people of his hometown to see. He withholds information from them. He's not able to do miracles in their presence like he was in other regions. God says, no. They have the information that they need. If they had seen Jesus perform miracles in his childhood and were welcoming back to town and, oh yeah, we've known all about him. That would have thwarted the mission of God. It would have sullied God's plan. And so, through Mary's obedience, the people in Nazareth don't know that Jesus is the Son of God, but she knows. They don't, they don't get to see the miracles that Jesus performs in other places. Because in God's divine wisdom, he's, he's waiting until the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because it is in the gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. 
But we're on the other side of that, aren't we? We have all of that information. The gospel is clear. Just like it was the Father's will and design that Jesus would not perform miracles in Nazareth here in Mark's gospel. There would, however, be a proper time for that unfolding. A fixed time by God in which the Nazarenes would have the gospel. They would have the same amount of reasonable evidence as their Galilean neighbors that Jesus was the Christ. And God would raise him to life for all to see. Not only in first century Judea, but around the world for ages to come. His resurrection sealed the good news. That's what the gospel means. The good news of God's master plan of salvation. The gospel would have to be enough for the Nazarenes. And it would be. And it is enough today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is God's plan of salvation. And it is enough to save. Jesus' divine nature was never an unfolding phenomenon. There wasn't a stage in his life where Jesus stopped being human and became divine. There wasn't a time in Jesus' life when he put on divinity or something changed. He was always divine. His work of salvation, however, is an unfolding phenomenon. And the next and final unfolding of his work of salvation is his return. The last chapter is not finished. He's coming again. Be encouraged, Christian. Until then, God has given us the gospel. We have it in all of its fullness. It is the power of God to those who believe. It is rejected as foolish and scandalous to many people in the world, but God opens people's eyes through the gospel. It is the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's his resurrection. It is enough. It's enough for you to rest in as a believer, to give you hope, to strengthen you every day. The gospel is enough. Amen? He has given us the gospel to believe. He's given us the gospel in which to grow. He's given us the gospel to share with others. The manifold wisdom of God is on full display in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In sum, the gospel is enough. And you and I have been entrusted with it at this time. comes again.